can't just start, we're not ready. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can only apologise. There's been um, a slight delay in proceedings. We're just going to um, rectify the situation and uh, we'll, we'll just pop the, um, the, the TV on for, for five minutes or so. Just put it on. Put it on. Sky. Believe in better. Okay, it's just gone 7.30 this Sunday evening and some big breaking news to bring you now. It centres on Watford and a key event taking place in the town tonight. We're hearing there's been a delay in proceedings this evening at Watford Palace Theatre where Tales from the Vicarage Live is taking place in front of a sellout crowd to launch the fifth volume of the popular book series. What we know at this stage is that the cast, which according to Sky Sources, includes former Watford players Tony Coton, Lloyd Doyley, Clark Carlisle, Nigel Gibbs and Tommy Mooney are still currently backstage. Well, we can get some more on this now and cross live to the theatre and speak to the host of this evening's event. It's Adam Leventhal, of course. Good evening to you, Adam. What's going on then? Vicky, hello. Welcome to the Watford Palace Theatre. I'm really sorry uh, that you come to me in these, uh, well, very, very difficult circumstances because... We've got a big delay and there's a little bit of a mischievous reason uh, about it because our cast are playing up. The one saving grace is that thankfully I've been able to tell the, uh, the front of house to just put some old Watford goals on, put the TV on so no one knows out there what is going on at the moment. I'll explain the situation to you because it's all rather worrying. I'm out of breath because I've been, I've had to go to the florist because Nigel Gibbs, normally the nicest man in football, is having a diva moment tonight of all nights. Nigel Gibbs, can you believe it? He is insisting that he has yellow and red flower petals scattered on his dressing room floor. So I've got the flowers. I can't believe I'm having to do this. Nigel, flowers are here. At last, my flowers. Orange? I don't do orange. What? Take them back. What? What's it? What? Oh, man. Okay, right. I'll just have to leave them there. They're there if you want them, Nigel. I want red and yellow. Okay, all right, fine. Okay, um, Tony Coton's going to be another one of our guests, Vicky, and rough and tumble, blood and thunder, muddy, doesn't care about his uh, appearance when he was a player back in the 80s. Now, it's all changed, I'm afraid, uh, Vicky, because he is insisting that he will not go on stage unless his trophies are polished to within an inch of their lives. Tony, can you... Tony, can you... Tony, Tony, Tony. Tony. Oh, sorry. Uh, Just making sure this is not... Okay. Is it ready to go then, Tony? I'm ready. To okay, go. brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Tony Coton. Cheers, Tony. Okay, right. So we're in the tunnel, apparently, according to Tommy Mooney. He's regressed to his former self as a, as a player. He's insisted on wearing the shirt tonight. He's insisted that I play the gaffer role, the manager. He wants a team talk before he goes out onto the field. He's here with me now in the tunnel. We should have had some advertising boards up for I'm you, ready, for you ready. Tommy. Ready. Right, OK, just hold just on a second. Just hold on a second. Look. I know yeah, you're, a, really look, uh, you're a great player, you're a great player, you can play defence, midfield, but I just want you to play up top today. Just get in the box, that's where you'll have success, OK? That's get in the box. I just want to get in the box, Gaffer, I'm rubbish okay. outside the box, just, just get, get me in the box. Just, OK, just get in the box. All right, Tommy, brilliant. Right. Give me a hug, come on. Cheers, Gaffer. I'm going to do it for you, Gaffer. Go for it, all right, well done. Right, OK, Clark Carlisle's here. Happy cu Clark, yeah? Uh, just, just a minute, there's a Pikachu here. Oh, uh, uh, just... <sighs> Delays everywhere. Where's Lloyd? We haven't even. We don't even know where uh, Lloyd is. Oh, oh he's, he's just round the corner. Just a minute. I've got an all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, Lloyd, what's going on? Harry, give me your, give, what? give me your Lloyd? outfit. Give me your outfit. I just what? Want one more game at the Vic. Just one more game. What? So, okay. Harry, is that all right? But, uh, all right, Lloyd. Thanks, mate. Thanks. I don't, okay, gents, we're gonna have to go out there. All right, whatever happens. All right, all right fine. All right. Okay, okay. So. Vicky, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, it's all a bit chaotic, um, but thankfully the one saving grace is that the people out there haven't got a clue what is going on. So uh, we'll leave it there. Back to you in the studio, and hopefully later on I'll be able to report on some positive news from Tales from the Vicarage live. Okay, right, thanks a lot. Right, boys, we ready? We happy? Have they been watching the old Watford goals? Yeah? We've been on Sky Sports News. What do you mean? We've been live all the time. What, so they know what's... 
<laughs> oh man. Okay, right. Uh, so I have to. Do, are we ready to go out? We're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll do my. I'll do, I'll do my voice. All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage your host for Tales from the Vicarage Live. It's Mr. Adam Leventhal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can only but apologise that we had that delay, and I've only just just realised that you have been watching Sky Sports News, so you know what's been going on backstage, I, I presume. Uh, it's all been rather unfortunate, but, you know, we have to roll with the punches. Um, was it rather unfortunate, or was it something completely different? I wonder. What was going on? Have you just witnessed the latest yeah, shock of... Watched. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Tommy. Lovely Tommy. Tommy Mooney there. Tommy Mooney. He will run through brick walls for you. A wonderful, wonderful man. Wonderful man. Okay, so have we just witnessed the latest shock of 2016? Forget Brexit. Forget Donald Trump getting into the White House. Nigel Gibbs, a diva. Tony Coton polishing his trophies, or have we witnessed, ladies and gentlemen, some of the greatest acting performances that these four walls have ever seen, ladies and gentlemen? What's the verdict? We're in pantomime season. I think it was true. I think it was true, ladies and gentlemen. Was it true? I can't hear you, ladies and gentlemen. Was it true? Of course it wasn't true, ladies and gentlemen. Of course it wasn't true. Why the hell did you do it then, Adam? I hear you shout. Checking the refund policy on the back of your ticket. Stop wasting our time and get on with it. I'm sure you're thinking. It was to challenge your expectations, ladies and gentlemen. Your preconceptions. It was there to shock you, ladies and gentlemen, because currently, as Watford supporters, we are living in an alternative reality, where we are a Premier League team. We're not only a Premier League team, ladies and gentlemen, we are eighth in the Premier League. We don't go to the big teams anymore and get hammered. So, okay, part of it is true, part of it is true, but in summary, What I wanted to say to you is that life as a Watford supporter now, we're here at the launch of Tales from the Vicarage 5, is a wonderful tale of the unexpected because we are exceeding expectations. Has that made any sense to you whatsoever? Because it was a harebrained idea that I came up with yesterday and we've just done it. Did you enjoy it, ladies and gentlemen? Jolly good. Right, shall we move on? Okay, thank you very much for being here uh, this evening. Tommy? Well done on your performance. It was excellent. And to everyone backstage who has uh, really, really uh, performed very well indeed. Shall we get to some guests? Yes. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah, I need to do one thing. (laughs) Seeing as uh, he was banging on about them before, this is something that was actually partly true, that Tony insisted on having his trophies on show. Okay, our first guest this evening, a man who made 291 appearances for Watford. He is a Hall of Fame member. He won the Player of the Year Award and unmatched three times, ladies and gentlemen, during the 1980s. He is the first name on our team sheet this evening. Put your hands together for Tony Goulton. Yeah. My arm's a bit sore from polishing the trophy. <laughs> so, Tony Coton, wonderful to have you with us, and wonderful to, to have you in the book uh, as well. Um, in terms of 
the reception that you get when you come back to Watford. It's interesting you mention it in the book, that you went back to the Man City game last year, and you were saying, I'm not sure if any of the crowd will remember who I am. But they do, and it's moments like that that realise that the highest scene that you're held in at this club, you must be very proud. Well, I had a little sneak preview. I, I was behind the curtains watching everybody coming in to see the age of people coming in. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm in good company. <laughs> Let's talk about these trophies then. Um, yeah. Great acting, by the way, I love that. You really gave it some, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you really, really did. Um, let's, I'm, let's I'm talk quite good at that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. OK. <laughs> you were the second name to be inducted into the Watford Hall of Fame behind uh, Luther Blissett. The Hall of Fame award is the one on the, uh, the far... Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hall of Famer. Thank you. Of course. Um, the Hall of Fame award is the one on the far left-hand side. Of all the awards that you, you have, to, to know that you're going to have a place in the history of the football club forevermore, from here to eternity, how much does that mean? It means everything. Um, you know, it, it was a big shock to me, actually, when, um, because I come down on the pretense I was going to present the Player of the Year. And um, when they called me up to receive this award, I've got to be honest, I got quite emotional. Um, you know, to be second, obviously, you know, if it, if it was going to be a manager, then obviously Graham is held in high esteem mm. in, as far as Watford's concerned and, and myself. Um, then if you're going to be second, it's going to be to Luther Blissett, um, without doubt. To be second in the Hall of Fame was absolutely astonishing for me. Um, and it was, um, it was something that... I can't surpass it. I'd never surpassed that. Once I got that award, that was, that was everything to me. And, um, you know, I'd like to thank everybody that, um, that voted for me and, and into that Hall of Fame. Proud of you. Now, the, the, the dish. You, you've got three um, Performances of the Year awards etched onto that. Uh, there's one against Coventry, one against West Ham, one against Liverpool. To go to Anfield and any footballer will tell you, or any goalkeeper will tell you. Any if you, player will tell Yeah, you, if you yeah. put on a performance at Anfield, you get a, a magnificent reception from the cop. And um, I did that night, and, um, you know, it'll live in my memory ever, ever more. The Player of the Year award, uh, three times you won it, and that hasn't been matched by anyone. I think it soon will be. <laughs> by, by who, a, do you think? By a certain Troy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But until that day comes, it is uh, an achievement. I was that hoping he would have got sold in the summer. Actually. <laughs> 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 Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but you won that in '86 and '87 uh, initially, when Watford were finishing. Well, they finished 12th and 9th respectively. What are your fondest memories of that period of time? Um, the whole time I was at Watford was a, was a great time for me. I mean, it's, it's gone on record that, um, and we, we might touch on that, I don't know where you're going to go, but um, I come from Birmingham with a, with a bit of a reputation, which mm. was a, a stigma and a, a thing which, if you want to go on to that, I can tell you about it. But, um, tell us about it, it Tom. It was tell a, us about <laughs> it. Come on. Let's get it over with. Well, I come down to Watford, didn't I, with a reputation of, um, uh, of uh, uh, a beer drinking, um, bird <laughs> um, fighting reputation. And I can say now, and I'll come out honestly, it was all true. <laughs> and the, the only thing that's changed now is that uh, I don't fight anymore. It gets fucking... <laughs> It hurts you. <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, you did come down with... Yeah, with, I did. And, and in the I, midst of a difficult situation. I can remember it as clear as day. I went into training and I'd been out with... Sorry about mentioning this name by it to everyone, but my best mate's Mick Arford, you know that. Um, I know. But um, I'd been out with Mick, I'd stayed at Mick's house. Can I just tell you one thing? On the poster for the Tales from the Vicarage Live, um, he, that's a crop of you... And standing, Mr. Harford. Standing next to him. And I really yeah. enjoyed just 
cutting him out. <laughs> Get out of the way. Get out of the way. I'll tell him on. that Carry when on. I'll see Carry on. Yeah, I'm sure it takes it well. Yeah, don't mention So, uh, I'd been out with Mick and I got called into training. Uh, I, I, sorry, I was in training. I got called into Ron Swandy's, his office. And um, the manager said, listen, we've had an offer from Watford. Um, you're free to go and speak to, to Graham Taylor. And um, I'd left my car in town with Mick, lived in Solly Hall, blah, blah, blah. And um, they, the chief uh, scout, Norman Bodell, drove me down. And I said, I need to stop. I need to stop and I need to speak to my father. I said, I can't go any further. I can't get in front of Graham Taylor without speaking to my father. So we stopped at Toddington Services and it was on the payphone. And I said, Dad, I said, um, listen, I'm at Toddington Services. I'm about to go and speak to Graham Taylor at Watford. And um, he said, right. And I went, what do you think? I said, Birmingham City is my team. That's who I've supported. I've, I've played 100 games now and well established. What do you think? He said, if you don't sign, don't come back home. <laughs> really? <laughs> I said, what are you on about? Because he was a big blues fan as well. He said, get away from this area for, to save your career. He said, you're mixed up with lads that you've grown up with. You've got into a couple of scrapes. He said, just do me a favour, please. Son, if you want to... He said, sign there. Listen to him. And I've, I've said it before, once you get in front of Graham Taylor, you ain't coming out of there without signing. <laughs> he was the best, the best ever, honestly. Why? why? Tell us why. Just... In a, in a, a manager-to-player scenario, I mean, obviously no, we know about his successes, but why was I he think so the, good? The biggest thing was, within half an hour of speaking to Graham, I met him at the, I don't know what it's called now, but it was the Ladbrook Hotel on the A41 there. And I met him in there, and um, within half an hour, he told me more about myself than I knew about myself. Mm -hmm. He knew about my family, he knew about my mother dying, he knew about my brother-in-law uh, passing away. He knew everything. And I'm thinking, how, do, how does this matter? And he'd gone into every bit of detail about my family. And the, the one thing he said, he said, I know you're not a bad lad, but you've just been in the wrong company. Mm -hmm. He says, and I want to bring you away from that, blah, blah, blah. And um, I thought, you know, Hearing the words of my dad, you know, I thought, this is the place for me. And I, and it was. And I had six fantastic years here. And it's a place I, I really hold dearly. And just a, just a word on, on expectations. Obviously, we did all that stuff before. When you joined the club, Watford were already established as a, as a, as a top-flight team. What was the, the feeling about the club from, from outside Watford? It, it was... <laughs> to be funny, it, it, it was the first professional ground I ever played on. I was at Villa as a schoolboy, and we, we come down here and played in the Southern Junior Cup, and we played Watford, and we won here four 0 But what Vicarage Road was my first ever professional ground that I ever played on, and um, so I got a little bit of taste of this, that, and the other. Watford obviously weren't the, weren't the club that they were there uh, when I joined, and. Um, I'd done my background, I looked at the players, I mean, when you look at, you've got John Barnes on one wing and you've got Nigel Callan on the other, Mo Johnson, George Riley up front, a very, very attacking-minded team. And Graham said to me, when he met me, he said, listen, I've got a young back four, he said, I need somebody, he said, oh, and his last words were to me, I watched you at Fulham, I stood on the terraces at Fulham, and I heard you barking out the orders to a back four. This is what my young back four needs. Somebody, he said, unfortunately, I don't think Shirley gives it. Shirley, Steve Sherwood. Um, Shirley, Shirley does that, this, that and the other. And um, he said, oh, I need somebody to, give it, to, to get behind them and give them a rocket when they need it, this, that and the other. He said, you talk, you put people in positions, this, that and the other. Little was he to know I was going to let five in on my debut. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but they were the kind of conversations that I had. But I'd done, in that small, small window I had, because I only had a night, because from getting the phone call, from driving down, to ringing my dad at Toddington, to meeting Graham, I hadn't signed, and we played Cardiff the next night in the, in the League Cup, and Shirley went and saved a penalty, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to wait for my debut. 
this, that and the other. But I'd only got that night and there was no internet like there is today and you couldn't find out. So I was trying to find out as much knowledge as I could about the players and the club. All I knew really was that we had two fantastic wingers in, in uh, John Barnes and Nigel Callan. And, um, you know, and I just thought to myself, well, we're a very attacking side and the managers talk, talked about we will score more than the opposition. Mm. And I thought, do you know what, I've been in a team here now where one nil and we could get a, get a result. We would never, I was at a Birmingham team that would never score two goals. And I thought, you know, I think it's time personally and professionally to move. And that's, that's why I made the move. Well, we're very glad that you did. A round of applause for Tony Coton, please. It is uh, time now to meet our second guest this evening, a one-club man who played for Watford from 1983 all the way through until 2002. Second on the all-time appearance list. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome onto the stage, Nigel Gibbs. Did you enjoy that bit of acting at the beginning there? You were very good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I definitely don't like orange. That's a definite. <laughs> Take us back to your debut. Wednesday, November the 23rd, 1983, Sparta Prague in mm -hmm. the UEFA Cup. That was a bit of a baptism of fire, wasn't it? <laughs> it certainly was. Um, in those days, we used to come and train in the morning of a game. So I didn't know actually I was going to be playing until the morning. So uh, I came in and Graham Taylor said to me, oh, fancy playing tonight? And um, I looked at him and thought, oh no, I'm not sure about this, what's he <laughs> saying to me? So eventually obviously uh, got selected and played and uh, what, what, you know, what an evening for me. Um, obviously the result didn't go too well, we lost 3-2, but for me to get that debut at Vicarage Road, playing with the players that I'd watched from the stands as well, um, obviously it was a great night for me. In terms of uh, how you came to be a, a Watford player, obviously you said in that clip there, boyhood Watford fan, how much of a dream was it to, to play for the club? And yes. how difficult was it to, to get to play for the club? It's very difficult to become a professional footballer and um, obviously my route was no different. Um, my father had actually joined the club in 1977. He was uh, manager of Hemel Hempstead and Graham Taylor asked him to come and do match reports for him, scouting and coaching. And when uh, he, he worked with Tom Wally, obviously he's very, very well known here, uh, actually legends of, of a guy. And um, he said to him, my son plays, come and have a look at him, see what you think. And uh, I was playing for St. Alden City Youth and he, he came and watched and liked him, liked me and I joined and, and the rest is history. But uh, yeah, no, uh, obviously fantastic. Um, just before I go on, I, a lot of the older supporters uh, will remember this scarf was from 1978. My wife's been dying for me to get rid of oh, it. Wow. So uh, <laughs> silk scarves, probably the uh, younger ones don't remember that. But, look at uh, that. 1978, I got that. So that was my Fantastic. scarf. Fantastic. I'll pop it up on the old, um, pop it up on the table. Come on, hang on a minute. Nigel. <laughs> Give it a bit of prominence. Right, here we go. Look at this. Do you, do you like our table, by the way? Yeah, Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Look at that. It's like being on Soccer AM. Yeah. Right. My right. first scarf, that was my first scarf. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, when you had made your debut later on in the season, I wanted to ask you this, you were playing in the build-up to the FA Cup final as well. Was, was that because Graham was keeping people fresh or was there a genuine chance that you could have, you could have been in there? Um, actually, just before we go, after that, uh, my debut, on the Saturday, I actually played in the youth team. Right. On a Saturday, so it was uh, kick your feet on the ground, Gibbs. He, uh, he, obviously, you played your game, but you're back with the youth team now until... Obviously, you get a bit more experience, but uh, yeah, at the end of the season, um, there was injuries. David Barsley was injured, um, so we all actually played on a, a practice match. I don't know if TC remembers um, on on a Thursday. You weren't there, were you? So you won't remember. Um, <laughs> and David Barsley played in that game, and so did I. So th there was um, a chance that I was going to be involved in the cup finals in the squad. And eventually, um, Neil Price played and Dave Barsley, but Pat Rice and myself were also vying for the position, but um, unfortunately, it didn't go my way. Just tell, for the people who weren't around then, what, what was it like around Watford Cup final day? For me personally, it was, a, it was an incredible experience. Um, you know, I was 18. Um, 
in the squad, played a couple of games prior to it, and then to be involved in the cup final. Um, I was part of the build-up, obviously the training camp beforehand, going on the coach up to Wembley uh, in the dressing room. Actually, um, I was meant to go round on the, uh, the, the Greyhound track uh, with an Everton player with the FA Cup, but they didn't turn up, so I never even got to do that. So we were meant to drive round before the game, so that didn't happen because they, 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 their player didn't turn up. But uh, um, obviously it's a fantastic experience for me. Um, I'd love to have been involved, um, but... Uh, I, you know, it's uh, say the gaffer went for Dave Barsley and Neil Price, so uh, that, that was it. We well, were certainly involved plenty of other mm, times. You big started. Risk, Dave. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you've start, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've made the most starts yeah. for Watford. That's correct. Obviously, yeah. second in the all-time uh, appearance list behind Luther Blissett, but the most starts. Yes. Just to, I mean, what does that say about your reliability? Um, well, I wasn't sub much because I wasn't going to come on and change the game. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to score many goals, so as a full-back I wasn't sub much, so that was uh, probably um, the reason that I wasn't, uh, you know, at the all-time, but obviously Luther's up there and rightly so. But for me, um, you know, uh, I always wanted to, some people to say that I, I never gave up, always gave my best, reliable, and that was, that was good enough for me. Um, so that was, that was what I was all about, really. I think a testament to Nige really just butting in it, mm. was if you were ever to give Nige a mark out of 10, you could guarantee it will be a 7 or an 8 every week. Mm. It was never a 5 or a 10. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That's... <laughs> Unlike myself. Yeah. Actually, um, uh, that was, listen, I, think... I mean this in a good way. <laughs> Nigel Gibbs, seven. That's what he was. Talk no, it weren't Gibbs, he was seven. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, he was Mr. Consistent, and that's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm trying to, trying to <laughs> fucking give you the back of the back, the back of the... Oh, <laughs> shut up. I'll get me coat. <laughs> now, Nigel's got a, a chapter in volume two of Tales from the Vicarage where he names his best 11, and we'll go through that later on in the, in the mm. second half, but you named Tony as yes. your number one. Two right, he did. Yeah. <laughs> I knew he was coming I'm to I'm sat yeah. next to him, that's yeah. why. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there is a little bit of a diva in him because he did name himself in his own uh, side as well. So that's, you know, fair enough. Fair enough, but... Someone had to. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. Yeah, you did. Um, in terms of what it was like playing in front of him and the fact that he said he was barking out orders, how did it, how did it differ once he came into the side? Um, that was the big thing I heard Tony speak about it earlier, that um, for me, a goalkeeper giving that information is, is so valuable for a fullback, um, for a defender, and that's just what we needed. And I think uh, for me personally, it really brought me on, really, really brought me on the information, when to get tight, when to cover, when to push on, whatever it was, the information that he gave was, was and I, I'll put that in the book, you know, that it was so valuable for me as a, as a player. And also going into my coaching career as well, just listening to, to Tony, John McClelland, obviously the gaffer, the, the grand sailor. But the experienced players at the time really, really helped me. And, uh, you know, I, I think without their help, I probably wouldn't have played the games I did. Oh, I wouldn't say that, nice. Why didn't you listen? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, we'll, we'll obviously have a, a moment to talk about the, the highs, and, and we've talked a little bit about Graham Taylor, but I wanted to get both of your opinions you know, things change and we're experiencing it now, uh, experiencing it now with Watford and, and managers coming and going and at the moment things are heading on the right path. When Dave Bassett pitched up, <laughs> oh, it's, Time it's for like, a break. It's like, it's like Panto again. <laughs> Boo. No, but just tell us about, from both of you, going for, just tell us about that time. Because it was such a shift, wasn't it? It was such a jolt. Are you starting? Or Come on, what? both of you. Both of you are going to have to say your piece. I'll let Nigel start. Go on then. I think we, we had a, a reputation where we worked really hard at Watford, and we did. And even Tony had to do the cross countries. And I remember one occasion, Tony, just before we go on, mm. was in Casterbury Park. I was down the bottom, and I was one of the poorest long distance runners. But I, I fortunately could beat TC. There's one occasion where Not hard. <laughs> I was at the back. And all of a sudden, the groundsman van came past, and in the back of it was TC. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So when we get to the top, he's obviously jumped out. He's beaten Fresh me. Fresh as a daisy. <laughs> and GT gives me a rollicking for not beating TC because he jumped in the back. <laughs> Let's get back to Dave Bassett. Okay. <laughs> so, what happened with Dave Bassett? Yeah. We, we worked really hard. Now, the reputation of Dave Bassett was, oh, it's army training, it's going to be this and that, but it wasn't. It wasn't as hard as what we'd been used to. Also, his signings that he brought in and the players that he got rid of, then you're going to be in trouble. Mm. And I remember when we was at Portsmouth, and not myself, but Tony was in the stand, Luther Blissett was in the stand, I was in the stand. There was about four other players that actually at what we're regulars, heart, really, we were regulars right. and we were all in the stand at Portsmouth and you're thinking well there's something not right here so he changed things too quickly brought wrong players in got rid of the wrong players and if you do that you're going to lose why didn't he understand what was what was needed no, I, th I think he changed like Nigel said he changed things too quickly we listen rightly or wrongly Graham had his his methods um, you know we were, we were brought up that you had to come into training clean shaven no jeans um, it, we were really disciplined, and that's what Graham installed. Um, he come in, he just said, call me Dave, or Harry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't Gaffer or Boss or whatever. Call me Dave, call me Harry. And it was a little bit... So, so from that, the first day, you, you thought, things are going to slide here. And, um, you know, then, like Nide says, he brought in a couple of players, um, apart from Glyn Hodges, who I liked Hodges as a player, mm. Um, you know, I think they were inferior to the ones that he got rid of, and things 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 changed too quickly, and all of a sudden he wanted established players out of the team. I remember it was around Christmas. I got and I, and the stories went round that I was on. The and this, nothing could have been further from the truth. Um, I got dropped for Mel Reese, God rest his soul, over Christmas. Uh, Nigel was left out of the team, Luther was left out of the team, and favourites were left out of the team. And that's the manager's prerogative, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I make no bones about that. Um, but it, 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 just, it just went on the slide from there, and it wasn't good. So, okay. it wasn't a good period, to be, to be fair. Nigel, quick word um, from you before we head into our next guest. Can you remember your emotions when you played your last game for Watford? Just tell us, tell us about it. Um, obviously, I knew it was going to be my last game. <laughs> Again, you, you, you think back. I came on at left back. I wanted to come on at right back. <laughs> um, but obviously, it was, it was a great occasion to say thank you to the fans and uh, to, to finish my playing career. Um, I was actually quite fit at the time, and, and I could have gone and played elsewhere, but I didn't want to finish my career anywhere but Watford. So, um, obviously, uh, I was then going to go on to the staff as a scout, but eventually... Luca left and Ray took over and became on the coaching staff. But uh, obviously, uh, after 20 years as a player, it was very emotional and uh, family and friends were there. And uh, you know, I'm very proud that I stayed at one club. You know, people say, have you any regrets? None, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. And uh, I loved every minute of it. Obviously, there was dark times when the team weren't doing very well. But uh, you know, to, to play for the team you supported is, is obviously everyone's dream and uh, very proud of that fact. Round of applause for Nigel Gibbs. Okay. So, as Nigel Gibbs' career was, was coming to a close, there was a, a new kid on the block who came and stayed and stayed and stayed. And now he is back here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Let's welcome our next guest. It's time to give a warm reception to Lloyd Doyley. Lloyd, good evening. Great to have you with us. Your first goal for the club in your 269th appearance. <laughs> Do you still run that over and over and over in your head? I know you scored another one. I know, but that one was what it was all about. Just tell us about your emotions when you see that. Um, I think the Watford fans don't allow me not to uh, <laughs> forget it. Oh, you know, they always show me on Twitter and, you know social media so uh, 
Yeah, it, it was a great moment, I must say. But at the time, we were actually losing 1 0. So uh, I couldn't celebrate the way I really wanted to <laughs> <laughs> until after the game. <laughs> Do you, do you still see it in your mind? Do you, do you close your eyes and imagine that? Because, it, I mean, it, it's a once, twice in a lifetime moment <laughs> that, you, that you enjoyed. Do you, do you still sort of think, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was brilliant. Yeah, I, I can actually remember at the time when I actually scored. I couldn't believe it actually went in. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't know um, where to go, did you? I, I thought I was offside. I, I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what went on. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a great emotion for me at the time because, you know, all the Watford fans were in shock as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, first goal, you know, it, was, it took nine years or so. so <laughs> yeah. A bit too long. Now, in the, in the book, it, the chapter's called Letter from Lloyd, and it's a, it's a privilege to have you in the book, because it's the first time that you've had an opportunity to say goodbye uh, properly, really, to the fans. You know, I, I knew from six weeks before that that I wasn't going to be involved, because I knew that I had, had to have a neck operation. Mm. So, um, you know, out of respect from Troy, um, he said, you know, you've been there so long, you can come up and pick up the trophy with me. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. But we, we still celebrated because, you know, we still still got promoted. Well, it's great that you can you can talk about it here tonight, and it's obviously great to have it in the book as well. Um, so I'm sure everyone will in, will enjoy that chapter in particular. Um, when you were first arriving at the football club, that's the end. When you first arrived at the football club, how um, important in your development was was the man sitting alongside you, Nigel Gibbs? Well, yeah, you know, um, you know, I grew up watching him. Um, <laughs> I grew up watching him, and um, you know, when, once I got into the reserve team when I was 17, 18, you know, Gibbo was, you know, coming out of the first team a little bit at the time. So, you know, he he, he coached me quite a bit. You know, he gave me encouraging um, information, and he helped me along my way. Now, you were um, involved in 14 seasons for Watford. And I, it's in the book, 13 different managers, I think it is. Yeah. I wanted to see if we can do one-word um, analysis of each manager. <laughs> or we can do thumbs up, I don't know, sort of marks out of ten. Now, if I miss anyone, hey-ho. Right, let's start with Gianluca Vialli. Honest. Don't, use any, don't use any of those you words. You put me on the, you put me on the spot here. Um, well, let's do th let's, uh, marks out honest. of ten. Confused. Six. Six out of ten. Well, he gave me my debut, so um, yeah. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Okay. And he played me quite a lot, so. Ray, yeah. Ray Lewington, obviously assisted by the man alongside you. Um, Two. How did you, <laughs> you didn't. You didn't play as oh, much under him as you would have liked, would you? No, I didn't. Uh, the next season after Viali, I only played 10 games. I was involved in the first team, you know, on the bench, in the stands, but I didn't play as many games as I like, and uh, so I give him about a five. OK. <laughs> now, I know you probably give the next manager five or lower in terms of your feelings towards him, I think. I might be second-guessing you. I'm talking about A.D. Boothroyd. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, because obviously Nigel, <laughs> yeah, Nigel left when AD arrived, and he talks about it in the book as well. You, you, you'll know all about that. But it, it went well for, for you under AD, didn't it? Yeah, um, it, it came, he it came in and he liked me straight away. So um, I think that season, when he came in, I played 50 games under him. So I only missed one game. So uh, I quite liked him, especially the first year. But... <laughs> The second year, when we got into a premiership, I thought, as a person, he, ch he changed. Mm. You know, there was a lot of hype about him getting the England job, etc. I think that kind of, like, got to his head. And, yeah, I just felt, felt he changed as a person. But the first year, I give him a seven. <laughs> Still a seven? You play 50 games and only a seven? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. High stat. Are we going to get him, a... What do you give him the second year? Two. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> Stop being mischievous, you. Right. I just okay. like people right, to be honest. Whisper, let's whisper in the rest of them. Right. Um, Brendan Rogers. Seven. Another seven. Malky Mackay. Seven. It's like having Len Goodman on the show. <laughs> Right, uh, if, you gonna say seven, if you're going to say seven to Sean Dyche. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Zola? A nine. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, Beppe Sonino? Oh. <laughs> 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 About a three. <laughs> okay. But it interests that you will read in the book as well. Beppe Sonino has, has done an interview in that. So. He has a, a big place in his heart. And I, I mean, it was difficult for him at the time because yeah. he couldn't speak English and he had an interpreter, so getting things across was difficult. Yeah. yeah. OK, and then we whizzed through Oscar Garcia. I didn't play under him. Yeah. No, uh, Billy Mackay. <laughs> no, Billy, Billy Mackay, Billy McKinley. Billy McKinley, you remember him? Yeah, he was good. Yeah. <laughs> he was into it. Uh, I, I liked him, he was about... A seven or eight. <laughs> seven and and Slavisa Jakanovic. Seven and a half. About seven and a half, yeah. <laughs> seven and a half. And Kike, I mean, Kike decided in the end, I mean... No, um, or, The decision already been made? Yeah, it was already made before that, but I had a neck operation, so that kept me out for six months. So uh, I was still getting treatment at Watford, which they had to do. So I met QK and spoke to him. It was a nice enough dude. <laughs> and what's, tell us, for the people who don't know what you're doing now. Um, I've just signed for Colchester about a month ago. <laughs> so, uh, I'm still playing, which is good. Um, I've still got another four or five more years in me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to play as long as I can. Um, you know, once football's done, you can't really go back. So, um, you know, I, I love the feeling of going out in front of people and playing. You know, I love, I love doing my job. And we, I know we were joking there with Harry the Hornet about going and playing an, another game at, at Vicarage Road, but how much would you love just hook or by crook getting drawn against Watford or whatever, just playing there one, one more time? I'm not too sure I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. Um, that would be a different experience. Uh, playing against Watford <laughs> would be a bit emotional, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd Doyley, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> OK, let's meet our next guest, who is a former teammate of Mr Doyley. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Clark Carlisle. So, here we are. Just first things first, just what was it like playing with, with Lloyd? With Lloyd? It was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was awesome because um, L Lloyd is, I think, he's either joint or, or the best fullback that I've ever played alongside. And that's because of his, his blinding pace. I mean, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was never more that more. quick. <laughs> I was never that quick, but if ever I made a mistake, Lloyd would be there to tidy it up, and that, that got me out of a lot of problems that day. Thanks, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell us about, and um, this is, this is inter it's an interesting dynamic, and it's what football is all about. You know, some people agree with some people. Nigel didn't like A.D. Boothroyd. You loved A.D. Boothroyd. I he did, brought, yeah. He brought you to the club. What made him um, the right manager, and why did he convince you to come to Watford? Well, the reason why I loved AD was because we'd forged a personal relationship before we got to, to Watford. So at Leeds United, he was um, first team coach underneath Kevin Blackwell. And Kevin Blackwell, uh, don't know if you've read my book, I, I'm not, not too fond of him. <laughs> um, he, was a, he was quite a disrespectful man, but especially so to AD as, as his first team coach. 
So AD was putting on some fantastic coaching sessions that the lads were really enjoying, and then the manager would come over and really patronise him. So, you know, we'd forged this bond over, over our hatred of Kevin Blackwell. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then when, uh, when AD like, got, got the job down at Watford, you know, I was like, please don't leave me. <laughs> don't leave me here. And that was genuinely the case, wasn't it? That was you, it, that was exactly but it. But you yeah. weren't going to necessarily go to Watford when, when you left Leeds, is that right? No, I wasn't. Oh, not immediately. When, when AD... Um, do you know, I didn't even know straight away. I only saw on the, on the news that AD had got the job. So I called him up. I was like, come on, please, don't leave me here. But then I'd fallen out with Kevin, and, um, and I decided that I was going to leave Leeds that summer. And as, uh, if people are or aren't aware, I wanted to stay up north in the Ombrons of North. I'd just left QPR. You know, I was going through a tough time personally. I wanted to be up near my family. And um, I was going to go and sign for Stoke, actually. Uh, do you remember the Dutch fellow who was manager at Stoke? What's his name? Anyone? Anyone? That Dutch fellow took over for about a year and a half. Van Pulis. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, it was something like uh, Boschfeldt or, or something. But I, I went over to talk to him, um, and he was, you know, typical Dutch. He was like, I, I heard you like a drink. Well, me too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. yeah, probably okay. not what you needed. It wasn't what I needed at the time, but it was, it was going to get me away from Leeds United. Um, but then AD must have heard that I was going to go and sign for Stoke or that I was available. And he called me and said, look, don't sign anything, just come and talk to us. I said, look, AD, you know, it's back down in London, it's Watford, you know, it's too far away. He said, look, just, just come and talk to me. You're going to sign for me, not for Watford. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it pains me to say I did initially sign for AD as a person. Uh, but it was one of the best decisions I made. I love my time here at the Vic. And that, yeah. first, that first season, the promotion season, yeah. Yeah. Um, Finished third in the, in the league, obviously went through to the, the playoff final, playing against your former side. Yes. And you go into it in a bit more detail in the book, but the fact that you couldn't play was so weird. Why, why were you not able to play? It was so bizarre. It, it was part of the um, transfer agreement, which I'd never come across before. You know, I know when you go out on loan, you make the decision whether you can play against your parent club or not. But when you transferred... You know, there surely there should be no restrictions whatsoever. But um, Ken Bates and Kevin Blackwell made it a sticking point that I couldn't play against Leeds United that season. And, and so, as, uh, as Sod's Law would have it, we get to the playoff final and it's against Leeds United. So, I, I couldn't play. And does that still, that still rankles with you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, playoff final at Millennium Stadium. I mean, last time I was there, I was with QPR and we got beat 1-0. So, you know, I like reclaiming places. So going back there, not having the chance to play was horrible. But it did produce one of the, the best moments of my life. And I don't just mean the result. Right, let me tell you. Yeah. Right, so I, I leave Leeds United, come to Watford, and Ken Bates sends us a bouquet of flowers. And on the flowers, it says, good luck at Watford. You'll need it. Oh, OK. OK, thanks. <laughs> So we go and beat them in the playoff final, so I send him a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> and on the card, I put, good luck without your parachute payments, you'll need it. <laughs> nice. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. Just a word about the, the attacking prowess in that side. I was looking back at the, the, the scoring yeah. charts. King with 22, Henderson 15, Young 14, Spring 9, Doily none. <laughs> <laughs> just, for that, just for that season, just for the record, just for the record. Um, I'm but how strong as an attacking force and how much of a pleasure was it to play in that, in that side, both of you? Uh, it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. And it's, it comes as a great relief to a defender to know that you've got that, that prowess in your side. Because even when you go a goal down, there's no feelings of desperation. You know, you still know that if, you, right, we concede a goal, 
Let, let's keep the back door shut. We know that these guys will produce. And Hendo and Kingi, like, as a partnership, I thought they were awesome because they weren't just the classic big man, little man, because Kingi could do that job on his own as well. You know, quite similar to, to Troy now. You know, he can play that, that sole striker on his own. But when you have, you know, one of the most wasted talents or unfulfilled talents I've ever seen is Anthony McNamee. This, this kid, ah, oh, he had ability. You know, incredible ability to manipulate the ball and, and whip the ball in. Another one, Hammer Boatza. Mm. You know, you, you look at the almost prodigious talent that we have, but it was too ephemeral. You know, they, 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 they just blew for two minutes in a game or for two weeks in a season. But when they did produce, they were awesome. And they did it for us that season, didn't they, Lloyd? Yeah. yeah. Before Clark uses any more words that I don't understand, <laughs> um, we're going to take, we're gonna have to take a break. Um, but I want you to um, put your hands together for, for Clark Carlisle, Lloyd Doyley, Nigel Gibbs and Tony Curtin. Right, gents, if you head off for a minute, we're going to have an interval. Off you go for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go forward, let's go back to something that was born in Tales from the Vicarage, Volume 2. We're all Watford till we die, but then what happens? He didn't want to die, but he felt his life force ebb gently away. He lost consciousness. Then he woke up and found himself cocooned in a serene whiteness. He had no physical form, no voice, no sensation of anything. All he could do was think the word Bugger. <laughs> time and time again in the surrounding silence. It was just like sitting in the upper Graham Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> then he regained physical form. He was amazed. His body had a whole new energy. It was as if he'd had Andy Hessenthaler's engine installed. <laughs> The whiteness misted into a dreary half-light. He saw rotting fences, crumbling garages, twisted brambles. He recognised immediately where he was. He was on Occupation Road, <laughs> behind the Sir Elton John stand. The silent twilight felt like a miserable grey limbo, just what life must have felt like for Luton fans in the conference, he thought. <laughs> Further up the slope, in brighter light, he could see people milling about. They were Watford fans, from different generations, stretching all the way back to 1881. A young girl from 1999 was wearing a replica shirt with Mooney on the back, and a man in a Victorian suit was sporting a moustache that looked as if it was some kind of tribute to Tony Coton. <laughs> he heard a voice say, all right, mate. Welcome to the afterlife. The voice belonged to a steward in a high-vis jacket. He reckoned he must be in hell, not limbo if stewards were involved. <laughs> he followed the steward up the slope of Occupation Road. He ambled slowly, staying at Nigel Gibbs's top speed. <laughs> Suddenly, an old man stepped forward from where the old Bill Mainwood programme hut used to stand. It was Bill Mainwood himself. He said, Up here, you can go to every Watford game for the rest of eternity. And that's not all. You can also go back to any game from the past. The new arrival couldn't quite believe what he was hearing. He could carry on watching Watford for the rest of time, tears began to well in his eyes. Finally, he arrived where the Red Line pub had always stood on earth. Now, in its place, in bright eternal sunshine, there was a magnificent gleaming building. He heard Bill Mainwood's 13-year-old programme assistant, Derek, say in his pure, unbroken voice, You've made it, mister! Welcome to Hornet Heaven! The realisation that he was in an afterlife paradise for Watford fans made his knees go weak. 
he started to weep. Tears of joy. Through his sobs, he heard Derek say, Honestly, you look just like Mr Mainwood did when Lloyd Doyley scored his first Watford goal. Get a grip on yourself. Thank you very much indeed. Colin Mace, ladies and gentlemen. Actor and lifelong Watford fan. And that was a little journey into Hornet heaven, just to uh, start our second half here at the Watford Palace Theatre. And thank you also to Ollie Wicken, who has uh, been a big part of this Tales from the Vicarage series. Uh, and he has uh, written another chapter for Tales from the Vicarage 5. And it all started, Hornet Heaven, in Tales from the Vicarage Volume 2. Now, it is time to get uh, another Hall of Famer on stage now. Can you come and have a seat over here, Tommy? Good to see you. The real Tommy Mooney. Excellent. Now, let's talk about your, um, your performances um, as a player at Watford over eight seasons. Tommy was here last year, and I don't think we actually mentioned your goal-scoring achievement in your last season. 18 league goals, and you scored more in the, in the Cup, so it was 21 in all, wasn't it, for that season? Was that your, your best season, your, your, the proudest season that you had? I think it, it was because it was in the Championship. I scored more in the division below a couple of seasons later, but I think uh, for me it was... I was in my last year of my contract. Ah. GT was leaving. It wasn't a reason why I scored more goals before <laughs> you started. <laughs> You just raised that extra 10% or so? No, I think from the pre-season, obviously the, the year before, we, we'd been in the Premier League and I'd not really helped the lads out at all because of an injury. Um, and I worked all the way through the summer. I had a holiday, but I went to the gym. I'd never been to the gym in, in a hotel in my life. Um, and I went every day. And I worked hard through the summer. And... Hit, hit the pitch rolling really from the st from the start of the season, and obviously, you know, I, GT played me up front all of the all of the season, so it was just rolling on really well, and a lot of tap ins in the six yard box from Tommy Smith crosses, so it's sometimes you just get get those connections, and it worked really well. All right, four. Uh, I'm all right too, are you? <laughs> Does so, anybody know what that means? Explain it. We then. worked Come on. together. Well, that that trophy there. We worked together, right? And we were sat in the office one day and somebody come in and started talking about Watford and Tommy playing at Watford. And they went, oh, Tom, he said, are you not in the Hall of Fame at uh, Watford? He went, yeah, fourth in the Hall of Fame. And I didn't say anything, I just sat there. <laughs> and it kept going backwards and forwards. And, uh, and they went, you played for Watford, didn't you? Are you in the Hall of Fame? I went, yeah, two. <laughs> so... Never mentions so, it. He never mentions it. After. So seriously, now every time he rings me, he'll go, "All right, two, and I'll go, "All right, four. <laughs> it is true. He's in my phone as number two. <laughs> He's in my phone as the baddie off at Stingray. <laughs> remember, remember the baddie? Stingray, Stingray. <laughs> so you're both working at, at Villa. Uh, at the moment. Yes, What's get back to me. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> tell, us about, tell us about what it's like working with, working with him. Well, unofficially, he's my boss, isn't he? Yeah. Unofficially. Unofficially, he's my boss. He only comes in a couple of days a week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in every day. But he comes in a couple of days a week. Now, we have... It, it, well, you can see what he's like. Everybody knows what he's like. It's a good little bit of banter. He's got a little bit of knowledge. <laughs> And uh, he br brightens a day up, doesn't he? Okay. Let's get back to um, relatively serious matters. Mm. Your evolution as a player, I, I joked about it in the tunnel. Um, the fact that you were cast in all sorts of different roles, mm. was that just because you were willing to please and you were, you were happy doing it? Or, or were you genuinely skilled in every position? <sighs> that sounds a bit bad, doesn't it? <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> no, but to That's have that adaptability, we talked about that earlier on. Yeah, I, I played... That's quite a unique thing, isn't it? I think um, 
I'd always played up front. I always played up front, and then I remember we played in a, a testimonial for the groundsman at the end of the season, and we played Arsenal at Vicarage Road. And uh, the gaffer come to me about an hour before the game. He went, "You're playing centre half today." I went, <laughs> "You started drinking." <laughs> he said, "I'm going to play three centre half. You million page. I want you to play on the left." I went, "All right." Yeah, no, centre forward to centre half, you can do it, it's dead easy, it's less running, I'm happy. <laughs> and then I looked at the team sheet and there was a young lad called Anelka. <laughs> I thought, well, he's getting booted, early doors. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, after about 15 minutes, he gave me five, five yard start, over ten yards and beat me by three. <laughs> And I thought, I'm not really sure this centre-half larks for me. But GT played me in that, when we played in, well, <laughs> League One equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, he played me as one of the three centre-halves. And I enjoyed it, I liked that role. Left-back and left-wing-back, no, nah, not for me. But I did it because I'd have a couple of shots. And I had a chance of scoring. I think I scored a couple of six goals or something like that, the season that we did it. Um, and then the season where we eventually got promoted. I, I, I waited half the season for me place because I'd had a row with GT. Well, I hadn't had a row. I'd, you don't have a row with GT, do you? <laughs> I said, I'm not happy. And he went, right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got to play in about January. <laughs> <laughs> he used to put me on for 10 minutes at the end and I'd come on and score and give him a growl and I could just see him chuckling to himself. <laughs> You're not bothering me, Mooney. <laughs> and then he put me in the team. I went on a decent run. We got, got to Wembley. Um, never scored at Wembley, which still doesn't bother me much. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, the, the Premier League and then the, the season that, that, that the goals came from. Um, but he told me in the March that he was going and that I was going because the new manager didn't want the bigger characters in the dressing room. And, you know, it was one of those things. I was coming to the end of the contract. I was on a Bosman. I sp spoke to Everton, went and met Walter Smith at Everton, but I knew I wasn't a Premier League player. I was a championship player. I was a good championship player. And Birmingham offered me more money, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a true story. Well, that's, but that's life, is it not? Yeah, no, no, it's, no, absolutely, yeah. There's a few more details to that. They had to sell Franny Jeffers and he, I wanted to know where I was going before I went on holiday and Everton weren't in a position to, to offer what Birmingham offered so I went to Birmingham to, to join another club that TC had played for as well as Spearmint's Legs 11. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't play for it. I went to it. Round of applause for uh, Tommy Mooney and for Clark and for Lloyd. Now. We're going to, um, we're not going to play Pictionary, we're going to um, get a best 11 that you can manufacture from the players that you have played with at Watford, and we'll compare it to Nigel's uh, best 11. Who did you have in goal, Nigel, and is anyone going to disagree with Tony Coton as the number one? <laughs> Especially from the, the, the present, the pre sort of more recent generations. Will, you, will anyone pitch an argument against Tony Coton? Clark or...? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's not comparable, but the best goalkeeper that I played with at Watford was Ben Foster, but still Tony Coton. Happy? Happy. Yeah. Who Foster? coached him? So, three... <laughs> Who coached him? <laughs> of course! I rest my case, Your Honour. Of course! At Manchester United? Fantastic. Right, fine. So it has to be Coton. OK. I can go now. Coton in goal. There you go. You're in keep. You're in goal. OK. Right. Back four. You picked you at right back. In my defence, I was told to pick myself, but I would push I'll probably for David Bardsley. Bardsley. Ooh. Can you uh, advance on any right backs that you know, Clark, that you might have played, played with or... I, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
so do we, what do we do? Do we have a, do we have a, a Gibbs, a, a Bardsley, a Doyley sort Cox. of split? Neil, so, Neil Cox. Oh, I Cox. thought you were just calling him. Yeah, I thought you were just being very disparaging what, the about the three of them. <laughs> right. Um, so who are we going for? Let, let's, OK, we'll put it, we put it to the audience. OK, so a round of applause it, for Gibbs. Who you play for. Hey. Oh. I can't put you to here. Doily. Oh. It's Doily then. <laughs> What's right? So right's over here, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Doily, right back. Okay. So you pick Sims and McClelland, McClelland as your centre half McClelland. partnership. Oh. McClelland definitely in. Definitely. He's a friend of the friend of the Tales from the Vicarage family, of course, as well. So he has to He's he has to go in. McClelland, two C's, one. L E L L A N D. Is that right? Okay. The other centre half. Well, are we playing three at the back? Are we playing five in the. Yeah, what are we doing? No. No, I know. I haven't got. <laughs> I, that's quite true. I haven't got any room on that. 4 4 2. Okay, right. 4 4 2, old school. Other centre half. Any other centre halves? Big Dan. Big Dan was one of the most phenomenal centre half partners I ever had. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That doesn't sound I, very popular to me. Yeah, I don't think you. I don't think you've. I think, think Mooney gets in before him, and he. Shitu. What was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> really? Simply played in the top division for five years on the spin. Sims. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's my I know. I know. I know. And left back. I went for Will Frostrum. Nine years. Yeah? Any other left backs that you can vote for? That you're going to raise? Paul Robinson was close. Mm. Will. Kennedy. Robbo. Will for me. I bet. You need to. You need to. The, the ones that I played with aren't comparable, so no, I'm not okay. even going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> we were decent, mine. Got it in. Right. <laughs> Midfield four, because there's an interesting choice in your midfield. You went with Andy Hessenthaler, did. didn't you? Yes. Um, as the, the ratter. <laughs> as far as... Um, Just as well, you wouldn't want him passing it, would you? <laughs> <laughs> so votes for your midfield two. You went for Jacket Correct. and Hessenthaler. Is anyone going to bump Jacket out of the, the team? Uh, no? Who's, who's our midfield? I went out there. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Alman Abdi. That's a good that is a very, very Rich, good shout. Richard Johnson. Richard Johnson. John O's a player. Yeah. Yeah. yeah John O's a player. This is a tough one. Alright, we'll we'll throw it to uh, we'll go between Abdi and Abdi and Jacket. Jacket for me. But... So Jacket in? Yes. Jacket's in. It's between Abdi and Hessenthal. No. <laughs> that can't be fair. That's not fair. Is that? What? No? Abdi. Abdi. Right, fine. Abdi's in. Abdi is in. Abdi is in. And Jacket is in. On the left-hand side of midfield? Can only Barnes. be one. Can only be John Barnes. Can only yep. be John Barnes. Fine. No one's disagreeing with that. Right-hand side? Callahan. Can only be Callahan. Callahan. Any right hand side? Not from me. Push? No? No. No? no. <laughs> On the Ashley Young. No? No, but. Ashley Young? No? Y Youngie was better when he left than when he was at yeah. okay. uh, Watford. He, Kelly he for me. Yep, fine. I'll put him in as Kelly. And two strikers. Now, this is going to be mm. tough. So you went with Kevin Phillips and Luther Blissett. Oh, so. Morris Johnson. So, look, hang on a minute. Are we all in agreement that Luther Blissett needs to be in there? Yes? Yeah. So, you're... Yes? Were you simply agreeing? Yep. Yeah. Good. Right, so Blissett. So I'll leave you in. And... Show it. Deeney. I've got to go for me, mate. Deeney. 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 Yeah? Yeah. OK. So Deeney is in. OK. So that is... Uh, Tales from the Vicarage 5, Dream Team. Okay, so...
there we have it. What we are able to do now is to throw the floor open to the audience if you have any questions uh, to ask. I also have some that have come in via Twitter. Now, we've got a question from Alexandra Tolshard. Yeah? Who I, I know exactly who you are because you're wearing this shirt. Are you not? Yes. Right. And you have asked... This is a wonderful shirt, by the way. Um, what, are, what were the panel's favourite shirts? And we've got loads of them here. <coughs> if you could select your favourite shirt, it may well be here. That is one of Clark's shirts, as is that one from, from over there. It's actually one of your shirts. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is one of yours. Your favourite your favorite shirt over the years, Lloyd? Um, I quite like the white and black striped. As a red shirt. Okay. Clark? Uh, I was only here for a couple of years. Yeah. I think my, mine was the, the Premier League shirt with the, the yellow and red with the red shorts. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I don't, have we got... That's, we haven't got that one, have we? Have we got that one? No, that we one. haven't got it. That, that one. one. Yeah. Nigel, yours? They were all woolen, weren't they, yours? <laughs> <laughs> and you want to have long sleeves? <laughs> no long sleeves. Um... I like the white away kit that we had, and also the one in the late, well, middle to late 80s, the, the yellow home kit with the red and yellow cell white. Tony, you, I, I always remember growing one. up, the green one. A green one. A green one. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, fat, like, it, it wasn't necessarily, I, I always remember you as having that, a grey one. Yeah, with, um, Actually, what was it? Uh, what was it, Express somewhere from MI? Eagle Express. Eagle Express yeah. was, the, was the sponsor. Yeah, now when I first come, uh, they put out this red goalie's top, red shorts, red socks, and um, I said to Roy Clare at the time, I'm, where's the green shirt? I said, the goalie's always wear green. He went, not here. He said, you got a red one? I said, I'm not looking like a phone box. <laughs> <laughs> Get me a green shirt. And we were arguing because Roy was a stubborn so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he said, you're wearing this or nothing. I went, and next minute, GT walks around the corner. What are you two arguing about? Gaffer, he won't wear the red shirt. And I said, I'm wearing a green shirt. I'll say, I ain't playing. Like that. And he went, just get him a green shirt, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was it. So I don't think you ever saw me in a red shirt. I wouldn't wear it. Uh, my favourite is my number nine shirt in the first... Premier League season. Of course. Yellow, black, black. That's, that's the kit I liked. Didn't matter what shirt it was, but yellow, black, black. I loved it. A question in from Mario. Um, where's Mario? Are you here? You must be here. Oh, well done. Hello, Mario. Thank you for your question. Um, if you could replay any game during your career, what would it be and why? It would be the player final when we won 3 0 against Leeds. I think that was awesome. No, mine would be the cup semi final against United, and I've won a different outcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that, I mean, that was what was so frustrating about that? Because I genuinely felt we dominated at times, and when we got them back to 2 1, we had a couple of chances, and then they just dispatched us at the end, didn't they? But that game, it's the only time I've ever felt like really competitive for the, for the entirety of the game with Man United. Nigel? Luton nil, Watford 4. <laughs> <laughs> Tony? I think Liverpool away in the only nil in the court. Well, the one where you wore the red, the red shirt? <laughs> the reddy greeny shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tommy? Uh, I'd love to play at Wembley again, I'd love to relive that, but not try and be so clever with my header and just put it in the net. <laughs> Tried to glance it into the far corner, because I thought it was clever. <laughs> Should have just edited it down and I'd have scored at Wembley, wouldn't I? Mm. But I haven't. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Right, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any more questions from uh, the floor? This is your one opportunity in front of this cast of Watford legends. Hello, sir. What's your question, please? It's the oldest question of all time. Red shorts or black shorts? Right. I've answered it. 
Black. Black. <laughs> Nigel. Red. 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 Oh. Okay. Elsewhere in the crowd? Yes. Oh, sorry. Right, yeah. Right. Good. Good, good. good. Um, questions? So, for the Sir. What, what's the best attackers you played against and for the attacker? Tommy, what's the best defender you played against? Well, I could answer both, couldn't I? Because I... <laughs> <laughs> I was crap at both. <laughs> I let the real ones do it. Um, Drogba. Mm. He was unplayable. We lost 4-0 at Chelsea. And he scored a hat-trick, I think. And <laughs> yeah. he was unplayable. Awesome. Uh, Bergkamp. Uh, unbelievable. Mm. Bergkamp or Overmars. Mark Overmars, yeah. quickest player I've ever, ever played against. Not just pace, but his acceleration. He went from naught to top speed in like two yards. Incredible. Mine was Overmars and Giggs and earlier on Peter Beagree. Oh, Beagree. Yeah. Ian Rush for me. Mm -hmm. Ian Rush, anything that come off you, he was, on, he was on it like a flash. So, very sharp. And your toughest, toughest opponent? As a defender in Elka, he ruined me. <laughs> <laughs> and still having counts, I know. As a striker, pro, I think we, we played against Spurs when Klinsman signed twice in the space of a couple of weeks. Yeah. The league and, and Cup, was in the league two cup. different yeah. Cups. Um, and Sol Campbell at that time, it was like running into a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, I was quite solid at the time, but he stung me a few times and was quick. So, there's your answer. Thank you. Okay, final question before <coughs> I, want to, I, want, I want to say one more thing. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have come out. I'll know that. <laughs> Um, I didn't feel any contact, I've got to be honest. Um, he towed it past me and I don't think he would have got to it, even if he just jumped over me, you know. But I'd never, never felt any contact. Um, I've watched it back once. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see why the referee gave it. So, sorry, I apologise for coming out for that. But, um, no, there was no contact, but um, I can see why the referee gave it, to be honest. And final question, um, which can go across to many of you, from Jamie per Parkins. Um, Jamie, where are you? Up there. Thank you very much for your question. Um, your favourite Elton John story or anecdote? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the camera's off. Put your phones away. Come on then. You got one? Uh, Yes, it's my claim to fame, to be fair. <laughs> How many people went to his concert at Vicarage Road? <laughs> when he stopped singing, I think it was Benny and the Jets, I've tried to find it on YouTube and I can't, and said, can somebody get a pow uh, is it a poucho? The poncho. What? Poncho, <laughs> yeah. So, well, he asked for a poucho, that's why I didn't know what he was talking about. He asked for a, a, a poncho to, so that Tommy Mooney's suit doesn't get wet because I've met him in the dressing room before and like a few of us had but I was a little bit disappointed because it wasn't a suit it was a jacket and jeans <laughs> but that is my claim to fame he stopped singing to get just me, for you just to get me a poncho have you got a, a quick one Tony no it's a, it's a quick long one um, <laughs> we, we went to China Graham had left to go to Aston Villa we went to China and there was no staff Elton and John Reed his, his manager came and we were playing, it was when I, I just broke my thumb before the semi-final. He said, come, come along with us. We went, and it was called the Great Wall of China Cup. And Still is. Gibbs, and the only, <laughs> the, everla the everlasting memory of it, the food was absolutely <laughs> And we used to go to Gibbs' room, because he used to open his suitcase and <laughs> a ton of custard creams in his <laughs> <laughs> Give us a biscuit, Gibbsy, for <laughs> sake. It cost you a quid. <laughs> so we lived on custard creams for a week out of his suitcase. 
So I remember that because the food was <laughs> but Anyway, he said, look, every time you progress, well, I'll take you for a proper meal, Western restaurant and all this. And he did. He was good to his word. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the lads uh, won the trophy. And he said to me, look, um, tonight, he said, I'm going to have a bit of a celebration. He said, and um, he said, any Western people in the hotel, he said, invite them down. He said, yeah, here's some money. Go and get a load of drink in. Get a room sorted. So I went and sorted the room out, blah, blah, blah. Got all the drink in, this, that and the other. And he was, he was brilliant. I went back up to his room and I went, here, our chairman, here's, the, here's your change in yen, whatever it was. Give him there. And he went, no, no, TC, keep that. So it was there. And we, we've got about 400 quid each. Here, now that be a day. Blah, blah, blah. Stop swearing. So, uh, sorry about the language. So, <laughs> sorry about the so, language. We've gone down, and that one's gone. I'm going to do a bit on the piano tonight. Invite anybody, this, that, and the other. It was brilliant. So we've in invited everyone. And I thought, I've got to get my camera. I've got to get my camera, and I've got to do this. And we'd be going into this restaurant every other day when we got through. <laughs> anyway, I've walked out, and I've hit this glass window. Bang! <laughs> smack on the thing, and I've gone back, and it's got f***ing hell. And I've looked, and all these Chinese waiters and, and, and waitresses have stood there like stony face, like, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, they're dying to laugh. <laughs> and I thought, F out. Anyway, I've got up the lift, right, right where's my camera? In my suitcase, blah, blah, blah. I've come back down. And as I've come back down, there's a bloke sat on the next, as Elton singing on the piano, this geezer's going, take another picture of me. This, I don't know where he's from. Take another one to his mate, blah, blah, blah. Take another one, blah, blah, blah. And he's gone. He said, oh, I've run out of film. He went, I'll go and get my camera. And at that, he's gone bowling off and I've gone to the lads. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and he's hit the f***ing door. <laughs> Honestly, and he's gone, f***ing. <laughs> <it." laughs> well, these Chinese waiters and waitresses couldn't hold it any, anyone. <laughs> All right. So that was it. The lads are laughing, blah, blah, blah. He didn't come, we didn't see him again. Right. Next morning we sat having breakfast and I'm sat across from Shirley, Steve Sherwood, like that. Next minute he's covered me in uh, Rice Krispies. I said, Shirley, what's up? He went, there's that bloke from last night, look. And he's come and he's got a big stick of tape and two black eyes, like that. That's my Alton John story. <laughs> Can anyone match that? No, no. No, well, that is pretty much all we've got time for <laughs> this evening. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for all your questions. I did want to say one more thing as well, and it, and it centres on Clark, and I, I don't want to embarrass you in front of all the audience, but I'd like to say from the bottom of my heart, it's great to have you here at, at the show. admitting that when I went to talk to him for the chapter, I had my own little teary moment as well. So I'm really glad you're here, you're with us, and you're fighting fit, and you're strong, and you have a future. And it is great to have you with us. And thank you very much to, also, Tommy Mooney, Tony Coton, Nigel Gibbs, Clark Carlisle, and Lloyd Doyley. <laughs> Round of applause for your cast. Gents, if you can head off. Well done. Tommy, thank you. Tony. Nigel. Clark, good man. Lloyd. Your curse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I hope you've enjoyed another Tales from the Vicarage Live. I know some of you have trains to get, so thank you very much for sticking with us. Enjoy the book. Keep in touch with us on, on social media and emails and, and whatever, and we will see you back here next time. Thank you very much for the support from the bottom of my heart. It means a lot to us, and it's great that this movement carries on. So thank you very much. Thank you.